Having just pushed the crystal liner out of the way and put it back on the shelf after getting it running, uh, now it's time to do something that I've actually wanted for a while, but I just sort of got by happenstance. A uh, friend of mine was over at an event down south, and they found some pieces of test equipment, and asked me if I was interested in any of it, and I said, yeah, yeah absolutely. I uh, got two really neat pieces of equipment, one of which I kind of had to fight them over, but we came to an understanding. Uh, I got it, they didn't. But I am I am going to try and find them something comparable as a thank you for, for snagging it for me. One of the things they got for me was this, uh, b and Model 1076 Television Analyst. And it doesn't look like much from the outside, but folks that actually know about these uh, b and K TV analysts know how handy they are. And they're also just a really neat piece of equipment because of the way they work. Um, so the very first model that b and K came out with of uh, this particular product line was the Model 1000. Radio Museum says it came out about 1957-ish, which based on the use of miniature tubes and everything, I don't doubt. And this model, the 1076, came out around 1960, and it would be supplanted about 61 by the more recognizable model 1077, and then eventually the 1077B. I have no idea what the difference between those two is. I have used a 1077 before, uh, an unrestored example, when I was working on my uh, RCA 9T246 television, the first TV I ever worked on actually, and I used, I used it, did a few minor repairs on it before giving it back to the, the uh, shop that owned it. I should have bought it, it was only like 40 bucks, but uh, didn't have the space, didn't have the cash at the time, broke college student crap, so. <clears throat> but this, I got this for $10, and I was psyched to have it. That's assuming that everything in there is actually good, because if it's not, I may be completely screwed. <laughs> So it's probably worth mentioning why exactly it's so interesting. It's like, it's got some knobs, it's got some other junk on it. What this does is provide a static image to a television set and audio. You can, you can generate a, an audio tone to make sure that the, uh, the FMI uh, strip is working correctly. Um, but yeah, this is a... It, it's, it's not necessarily a pattern generator so much as it is an image generator. Pattern generators uh, will, will literally just produce lines or dots uh, to output to a television. And they will have, you know, like, uh, you can either output them as a direct, a direct composite signal. Um, some of them might even provide, like, this provides uh, sync outputs and then the video signal by itself. It's also got one for color, and there's a 4.5 MHz connection, and there's even a 400 Hz test tone output if you really want it. But they just output a fixed sort of, uh, they just they output the, the pulses necessary to generate either a crosshatch pattern or some dots or something for checking vertical linearity and all that jazz when you're setting up a CRT. That's cool and all, but I, at least with the ones I have, they're a little spotty in their operation. The BNK television analysts don't just generate a pattern. They actually transmit a single static image to the TV. And the way they do that is actually rather unique. Now, normally if you want to send an image to a television, you need to have a camera tube. Uh, well, you, you, don't, you can get away with using uh, non-vacuum tube technology. You, can, you could use like a Logitech USB camera from a laptop with an HDMI output, and then go from HDMI to composite, then go from composite video down to an RF converter, and then from the RF converter. So it, it gets really long, really complicated, really quickly. <laughs> What this can do is you actually have a complete transmitting setup. You can insert a vellum slide with your desired image on it, and it will transmit that through whichever type of signal you really want. So you can output it to any one of the standard channels from 2 through 13, or you can set it to have an, a, uh, an IF frequency output if you want to bypass the channel selection and just go straight to IF. You have variable IF tuning to select whatever it is. Uh, this, thankfully, goes to the earlier stuff. So this is great for the Motorola's and my portable airline and any other early, I have a few other early 7-inch electrostatic sets that this will be handy to work on. 
because it'll do all the stuff below the 45 megahertz uh, frequency, so stuff from around 22 to 25 is great. Now there's also a lot of other features on this unit that I'm probably not ever going to use, but would have been handy at the time it was built. Uh, because of the electronics this thing has in it to do its job, it has the ability to provide uh, complete horizontal and vertical drive signals. So, say you're working on a TV and for some reason you're not getting either horizontal or vertical deflection. There are, I, think, I believe there are actually some, like there's a yeah vertical yoke test signal. You can check to see if the, uh, if the windings in the yoke are any good on the electromagnetic deflection sets. But you can also hook this thing up directly to the yoke. We've got plate drive, and you can select either vertical or horizontal here. You've got a connection uh, for the flyback. This, this thing has its own flyback and its own vertical and horizontal drive sections, and you can actually connect a malfunctioning TV to those sections individually and, and use it kind of like a... Uh, not really a transplant so much, but to bypass a malfunctioning section in the TV itself. Really cool. I'll probably not have to use that. It's it's there. And uh, also you have uh, adjustable bias if you need to do that when you're uh, aligning the front end stages. Uh, sometimes you have to apply a certain bias voltage to usually to override the AGC, I believe. And you've got fine attenuation of the color. And it says color over here. I'm not sure if that's like a, like a color, like it's got a like color burst crystal in it or exactly what that, I don't have an operator's manual for this, so I'm not quite sure what all the functionality it is. Oh, and this is handy. You can change the uh, polarity of the video signal because depending on who made the set, some TVs will actually have a negative, uh, a negative video signal instead of a positive video signal. And then there's amplitude of the sync signals and all that, which is nifty. But I think we should take a look on the inside to get a better idea of exactly how this thing does its job. So this little guy comes with a nice pair of little carry handles. Uh, they do seem to be still in relatively pliable shape. Can't say the same for the nickel plating. But uh, we've got a patch on the top with a nice little chromish knob. Let's see what we have inside. So this is what really really turns me on about these things. So, like I said before, usually if you want to send an image, you need a camera tube. Uh, problem with that is that you're going to wind up having to have all sorts of light sources. Uh, the image quality is going to depend on how the light's being fired at it. Then you need all the additional uh, sync uh, circuits to actually generate all the other junk you would need to, to generate a, a composite signal. So if you wanted a static image, you know, to, to go somewhere, you would have to bounce light off of a solid target. So you'd have to aim the camera tube at a drawing, shine light at it just enough so that everything is visible and clean, and then hope the camera tube picks it up. Not so great resolution quality of black and white TVs. It's actually pretty good. But I don't know how good it would have been if you were trying to do that sort of thing. Again, very lighting dependent. However, the other way that they figured out how to do it, and specifically this was actually used for sending the test pattern, the classic Indian head test pattern found at the end of normal broadcasting, and sometimes at the beginning of broadcasting, I forget what time of day they usually showed it, that, that image was a still image placed on basically a vellum slide and placed in a similar setup like this at the TV station. So what they do, and this one has it right here, in this case, I have, I don't know if you can see that, this is an official B&K TV analyst test pattern with their name on it, and it's just a, it's just a clear vellum slide. I am going to have to clean this though, it's a little it's a little gross. The whole inside of this thing is a little gross. And this simply slots down in front of this CRT we have in here, like so. So we have the CRT and all of its related components. So we have a flyback, uh, damper, or sorry, the uh, high voltage rectifier tube. Uh, let's see, it's going to be our, that's going to be the flyback driver, so like a 6BQ6 or something similar. What is this? 6DQ6, okay. 
So Dairy Queen made this. And then we've got, actually there's a pair of them here. And some additional associated circuitry back here for doing all of the horizontal and vertical controls. So this is an electromagnetic picture tube. This tube, I should point out, if you have one of these, uh, I looked this up, these were custom built for B and K. So this is a 5BK PV1 um, with apparently a sort of a bluish purple phosphor. So kind of, um, I think that's what the, actually the V after the P indicates that it's a, it's a violet phosphor because normally a P1 is uh, green, something like that. But these, these little CRTs were only ever made for use in these tools. So I don't think there's anything else that readily adapts to it if this one is dead. The only thing I can do is try to find another junk unit, either a 1076 or a 1077, or possibly a Model 1000. I'd have to look to see if they use the same tube for that. That being said, the last one I used, CRT was just fine. Uh, base isn't loose on this, and the ion magnet's still hopefully in the right place. The yoke and everything looks okay. It's a little dirty. Uh, and then the wax on the flyback isn't nah, isn't uh, crumbling and everything or melted, so that's pretty good. Uh, anyway, vellum slide in front of the CRT. We have what's effectively a normal television on this end with no video input signal. So all this is doing is drawing the electron beam across the front of the CRT endlessly. That's all it's going to do. The screen is going to appear to be completely violet when it's active. On the other end here, all by its lonesome, we have this RCA, is this an 8, what is this, 813, this actually has a, a very special socket, this is, is this a magnal base, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, either an 11 or 12 pin base, but this is, this is a 4422, the older, the 1000 used, I want to say an 813A, so this is a photomultiplier tube. So this is going to take uh, each individual, all the photons coming off of this CRT are going to be registered by this photomultiplier and turned back into a signal. So what'll happen is this thing will start scanning. It'll fire electrons at the, uh, the phosphor coating on the inside of the CRT. The CRT coating will glow that glow will go through our little vellum slide here, and that single beam hitting that one point is going to be picked up by the photomultiplier tube and then amplified. And then as it scans through the entire image, because this thing already has horizontal and vertical sync signals, the output from the photomultiplier tube is effectively now uh, a serial data output of this image. That gets combined with the sync pulses provided from the horizontal and vertical sections over here to create a composite video signal. And then from there, well, you can do whatever you want with it. You now have a complete video signal ready for transmission of this static image. And in this case, like I said earlier, you can just output straight as composite, complete with the sync signals. You can output the sync signals by themselves, or you can modulate that composite signal to one of the standard UHF channels, is it VHF? well, channels 2 through 13 anyway, or you can output it as uh, an IF frequency to double check that the IF stages are working, which means this would be super handy for seeing if the, uh, the front end of the TV is working or not. So if the tuner section doesn't appear to be doing anything, go right around it, hook right into the first or second IF strip and see if you get an image. So the beauty of this is that, well, when it was new anyway, it would have come with a whole bunch of these. Standard test pattern, which, you know, is probably the favorite because you have these nice little fine lines on here. These are used to set the focus. So you want to be able to see as many of these tiny lines that get narrower toward the center as you possibly can. I'm sure there's a limit depending on the, uh, the type of CRT and the, the age of the set and technology in it. But you can also get crosshatch patterns, dot patterns, all the other typical ones you would have an actual pattern generator for. This can do with a vellum sheet. And even better, if you want to, you could have your own custom vellum sheets made. And probably any photography shop could have done that. 
Uh, these days, I imagine you could probably get some sort of a clear plastic and do an uh, inkjet or laserjet printer on it and create your own test patterns or static images. I have read that some airports may actually have used these uh, to put vellum uh, departure and arrival lists on to show on the overheads uh, in, the, uh, in the lobbies. So that's, that's pretty cool. But what you effectively have is your own fairly lightweight, honestly, it's only got the one power transformer, uh, television studio. I mean, you can't, send, you can't send moving pictures with it. But you can still send a good, solid image to the set for, you know, uh, aligning RF and IF, or, or verifying the operation of RF and IF. And, yeah, just, just really, really handy. Now, I do want to try bringing this up very gently on the Variac because the 1077 that I worked on uh, was honestly in the same condition and it came up and came to life with very little coaxing. So I'm going to put my watt meter on this, my isolation transformer in the Variac, and let's just see if it, uh, it fires up. All right, I'm going to turn off some of the overhead lights here so we have a slightly better chance of seeing this thing in action. So I'm going to turn off this one. And uh, there should be enough light behind me that I can see anything going wrong, right? So I got my watt meter, voltmeter set up, and let's crack it very gently. Bring it up to about 30 volts here. See what looks to be a pilot light or something down in there glowing. Can't quite tell what that is. Is that a light bulb? Hmm. You can see the filaments on the horizontal section starting to warm up. And from what I can tell from the top, none of the fuses were blown. Uh, all the capacitors look to be intact. Probably leaky as I'll get out, but. It's not what we're here to mess with. We'll deal with that after. Okay, we're up to 50 volts. I'm not seeing any kind of crazy power draw. Gently bring it up to 60 volts. Power consumption is still pretty minimal. I'm hearing the flyback come to life. CRT filament is lit. Probably not quite enough to give me a raster. I'm going to gently bring this up a little bit to 70 volts. It's getting louder. Still nothing on the screen. should be pretty obvious when it's lit. However, I am seeing some blue glow from within the, what is that, the 6BD, 6DQ6 driving the flyback, so that one might be a little gassy. And it's not on the outside edge of the tube, it does appear to be within the electrode, so that one is probably going to have to get changed out. So I'm going to keep my finger on the off switch in the event that it decides to arc. Getting close to 80 volts. Still not seeing anything. Oh, I have external horizontal drive control over here. Interesting.
Okay, nowhere to go but up. We're still not quite to normal operating voltage, but I'm still not seeing anything. It's possible the magnet's never been knocked out of position, but um, I'm not going to go sticking my fingers around the neck of the CRT in the hopes of adjusting it at the moment. There is also a possibility that the uh, high voltage rectifier tube could also be dead. Just because the flyback's making noise does not mean we have high voltage. Yeah, I'm not seeing much of anything on the face of the CRT. And that blue glow inside the six, uh, DQ6 has gotten a little more ominous. So, I think... I'm just going to call it there. Um, okay. So on the good one hand, we know that we do at least have a good flyback, so nothing to worry about there. Um, however, just looking at the circuit boards in here, they are disgusting. And I probably got to scrub everything, and of course there's plenty of uh, caps in here that just are well past their prime. Now it looks like, looking at the CRT neck here, there is actually a blob of paint uh, placed over the magnet and the CRT, probably when it was assembled. So that's, the ion trap magnet's probably right where it ought to be. So I think the best course of action for this is going to be start cleaning up the inside. However, I think I will save that for the next video. I've got some other more expensive things going on right now that I need to take care of first before I can really start dumping money into another piece of test equipment. So... <laughs> I will save this one, probably work on it a little bit over the week, just start getting things cleaned up inside. Um, I probably have enough components on hand to do most of the circuit boards. I'm not sure about the electrolytics, and I think there might be some high voltage caps in here and the 1000 volt range that I most certainly don't have that I would have to order. Um, well, okay, before I end this, let's go ahead and see if we can at least get this out of the box and take a look at the underside. So I do want to see if anything's been done there. So I've got the unit sitting on its side at the moment. Uh, I wasn't quite sure how the cabinet came apart. It turns out the cabinet is actually just sort of sitting on top of the thing. So once you take out the front panel screws, you take the three uh, screws out of the back, and you take two screws out of each side on the lower skirt, and then the, uh, the upper section just lifts clean off of it. The bottom, on the other hand, requires you to remove all four of the self-tapping screws in the feet. And then there was supposed to be a screw here, that was already gone, and then this guy here. A bit of a nasty dent right there, there's also a matching dent in the panel, must have been set pretty heavily on something or dragged. Either way, we can bang that out later. Uh, tons of space in here, really, really nice, let me bring you in a little closer. So, not too difficult to work on, I would say. One of the nice things about a lot of this early vacuum tube circuit board stuff is that the circuit boards are completely accessible from the underside of the chassis. So when you need to go and remove and replace stuff, it's just a matter of grabbing it from one side, heating it up and yanking it out, and then you can plunk a new one in there. You don't have to clip wires or anything. Very, very clean. And what I'm seeing, honestly, is that this piece of equipment has not really been messed with much at all. Uh, we do have a number of these old paper dry electrolytics in here. One, two, three, four, five of them. This one... What is this? Okay, no, that's just a single... Is that just a single section? This is 20 microfarad. Can't quite tell. But we do have a four-section electrolytic up here. This one I'll wind up replacing with a terminal strip, and this one will actually 
be pretty easy to do that with because there's only one wire going to each of the four terminals. And they're fairly small gauge, so removing them and shifting them over should be a snap. And plus, if I put a if I use any one of the screws that there's actually a few screws under here, it'll be very simple to reuse as a mounting point for the lug, uh, for the terminal strip. Um, and there's a few probably older paper uh, caps with more solid outside. These are all original B and K parts, so those have not been changed. So those will be easy to swap out. And yeah, there's really not a lot going Oh, there are a pair of very tiny selenium rectifiers right here. I'll have to double check what those are for on the schematic. I don't know if those are part of the B-plus circuit or not. Uh, possibly, but they're kind of tiny. Hmm. Is that a... What is that? It's a dripped piece of solder that uh, landed on one of the wires. Interesting. But, uh, yeah, no, this should be very, very, very simple to go back in and replace everything with. So, in the next video, I will start uh, on the underside getting all of these electrolytics taken care of, assuming I have them. A lot of these appear to be in the 100 and 50 volt range, which I don't carry as many of those as I should. I don't do a lot of work on uh, All-American 5s. I tend to work on mostly 30 stuff, so 450 volt caps are more plentiful in my bins. This guy here, though, these are all 350 volt. We've got 240s. Oh, there's 240s and 80 and the 50. Don't know if I have anything in the 80 range. I might have to go up to about 100. So that'll be interesting. Either way, that's probably going to do it for this video. Uh, thanks for watching, and check out the rest of my channel for other really unusual junk like this. I'll be putting more of it up on there. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks.